This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. Underwriting for the production of AutoLine This Week has been provided by RSM. for challenges specific to your business by working with trusted advisors who help turn obstacles into opportunities. Experience the power of being understood. RSM, Audit, Tax and Consulting for the Middle Market. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine this week. Today, the topic is all about electric cars or more appropriately, How do you sell electric cars? You know, governments all around the world have mandated that the auto industry has to sell them. But in the U.S., for example, they only account for 1.4% of all cars sold. So how do you open that market up? That's what we're talking about today, because i got a couple of experts joining me on this. Mike Devorney is with a company called Escalant. And Mike, great to have you on the show. Thanks, John. And uh, Bob Gritzinger, who's been on the show before, is with Ward's Intelligence. Great to have you back, Bob. Good to be here, John. Uh, Mike, let's start with you. And just thumbnail, because I never heard of Escalant until I met you. What is Escalant? So Escalant's a human behavior and analytics firm. So basically, we work with uh, companies across automotive, energy, tech, really trying to understand from a consumer standpoint uh, what's going on and helping these companies shape strategies so they can be successful with consumers. Gotcha, and you've got a big study on that. We'll get that to that in a minute. But same question to you, Bob. What is Ward's intelligence for those who don't know? Uh, Well, we're the arm of Ward's that uh, works with data and a lot of great information that we mine from the industry to share with our subscribers and our readers so that they can make intelligent decisions about their business, about the auto industry. Including electric cars. Including electric cars, (laughs) in a big way. Yeah, Mike, let's get into your study. Mm -hmm. You've identified six different categories of people who buy new cars, and you've unlocked some ways of perhaps being able to market to them Why don't you start the conversation from there? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the the study is called EV Forward, and it's really the the biggest study that's ever been done focused on the next generation of electric vehicle buyers, really trying to understand what it is that uh, they're seeking out of vehicles and how to really win with them. And so, as you mentioned, we, we found that there are really these six distinct personas that buy EVs, and it turns out a lot of what we tend to hear in the industry of, you know, oh, it's, it's range or it's price, and we've just got to focus on those. Uh, it's a lot more nuanced than that. There's a lot more detail. But when you delve into those details, and that was one of our objectives, was, was to really have that depth where you could look at, say, f- different vehicle segments or different parts of it, um, you find that you really need to take very different approaches based on each of these different categories. Mm-hmm. So let's start with one, I mean, there's already a category of people who already have an EV, right? Exactly, you, exactly. You're not so much talking about them. Right. I mean, they've already bought one. Yeah, They're it's easy not about early adopters, them. exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. So what would be the, like the next category down from that? So, you know, our, our next category down as we identify as kind of the, the next EV buyers, the ones that are, that are really ready. Um, we have names for them because it helps sort of keep track of them, but there are our torch bearers. Um, and they're, they're a relatively small group. They're about 4% of the new car buying population. Um, and they're, in a lot of ways, they don't look too dissimilar from people who've bought EVs in the past. Um, they, can, they have a, a deep concern about the environment, and you know, they really see EVs as a good solution to that. So they're, they're sort of mentally already there on EV, um, but one of the big issues is, is that they just haven't had EVs at their kind of their ready that have been attractive to them. So. This they're, group, they're waiting for the they're, right they're, ones. They're waiting for the right ones. Yeah, I mean, this, this group has the means and the interest. Mm-hmm. But what out of the what's available, the the Taycan, the Porsche, uh, Audi e-tron, the uh, Jaguar I-Pace, all of these vehicles, or or at the other end of the range, the Bolt, what out of that doesn't appeal to them? You know, in a lot of ways, it's and, and this is where we found that. Uh, Some of the approaches that have been taken that are more kind of blanket statements for, you know, oh, we have to go after, you know, this this group and it's just a kind of a one size fits all approach. Um, It even applies within these groups. So if you look at these torchbearers, you know, they they have um, within them 
different brand loyalties, different segments that they like. So it's really, you know, as we go from a small number of EVs to a much broader selection, for a lot of them that are kind of sitting there in line, they're going to find individually the ones that work for them. It's not necessarily that one EV we see coming that's going to kind of click with that group as a whole and they're going to jump over. Uh, you know, again, it makes it more of a, a tough challenge. But this seems to be the perfect next step for automakers to, or group for the automakers to focus on. You mentioned that they account for 4% of all new car buyers. Well, if EVs are only selling to 1.4%, here's an opportunity to more than double sales. Mm -hmm. It, you know, it is, but in a lot of ways, it's not a group that I would spend a lot of time on if I was an OEM because effectively you've already won them over. You know, they're, they're sort of a moth to a flame. Um, you know, they, they need to know the EVs as they come, um, but this, it's a pretty well-educated group. Um, so we would actually suggest focusing energy more on our next couple groups, um, which aren't as easy to win over, but it, it'll take some time to get them. Okay, um, let's the take the next one. And All right, what so, do you call them? Um, so our, our next group we call the young enthusiasts, and, and in a lot of ways they look like the, the modern iteration of a car enthusiast. Um, they're a very hedonistic group. They're, they're very much about um, achievement and pleasure in their lives, and they're a group that sometimes gets characterized as the tech buyer, but we really disagree with that because uh, the data doesn't support that this is a, a tech buyer. In a lot of ways, it's a, an image of performance in a tech buyer. And it's really about hitting all those different things. But of course, when you describe those, those attributes, you realize that EV doesn't have an exclusivity on any of those. I mean, not one of those attributes is, oh, and it has to be electric. So right. this, is, this is a group that, by the way, talking to them about the environmental benefits of an EV, it's just total wasted airspace um, because they, they know that EV benefits are there. Uh, in a lot of ways, we, we talk about it almost like a fig leaf. They'll mention, oh yeah, you know, I'm interested in EVs because they're environmental. If you dig past that, and that was part of what we were going after, is you realize there's really nothing about their lives that's environmental. Um, it, <laughs> it's really more about image and performance and the technology. So the Mustang Mach-E would yeah. be a perfect vehicle for them, wouldn't it? It, it, it seems to be, uh, to really resonate with this group well. You know, it would be a vehicle that when it comes out, they should have a lot of attraction to, especially because this group, uh, they are really into, uh, you know, luxury and sports cars. So anything that sort of crosses over in that space is so going to be appealing. This is less about the fact that it's an electrified vehicle, more that it's a Mustang. Exactly. So exactly. how do you market to them? Do you say, hey, it's a Mustang? Do you talk about the performance? Or what would your advice to an you automaker? You don't have to do oil changes? What, <laughs> what part of this? I mean, these are people who like doing oil changes. Right, right. <laughs> uh, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, I would take a, a, a multi-pronged approach. Um, you know, one is we have a lot of detail on the barriers that, that this group has. And again, these are barriers not so much in, I would never drive an EV but barriers that need to be overcome to make sure that an EV ends up at the top of their shopping list instead of a gasoline-powered car. Um, so we, we really understand well their barriers and their motivations. And so, uh, you know, for us, it's looking at some of those motivations and seeing, you know, really trying to go after those. So, for instance, with this group, it's talking about the performance aspects of an EV. Um, it's really talking about some of the issues uh, related to uh, range or, you know, this group, Cost is a little bit of a factor. I mean, cost is a factor, obviously, for, for all groups. But, um, but this is one where, you know, being able to address that in some ways, this is the, the best combination out there of the things that they seek. So, uh, you know, one of the things I think of is, is back when I was younger, this would be a buyer who might be, you know, hot for something like a BMW M3. Well, now if you're looking at a vehicle that can offer, you know, if a BMW M3 is an $80,000 vehicle, Hey, look, our EV for forty-five thousand dollars can beat it zero to sixty. Um, you know, has great, great looks, great image. That's an easier way to sell to this group. And the cooler under the hood. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, exactly. And so these these young enthusiast types, they comprise what percent of sales? Most. So most so lives? they're um, they're about fourteen percent of the. Market. Oh, so big mm -hmm. chunk. Wow. They're much. You start getting much bigger. Um, yeah, that first group's pretty small. The the rest of the groups are um, relatively large in size. Huh. Okay, uh, down from the, the young enthusiasts, what's the next right, segment? Right, right. So our, our next segment down for them, um, we call our, our stewards. And effectively, this is a group that, like our first group, the torchbearers, you know, they have a, a strong environmental concern. But unlike the first group, the first group basically has the money to 
have a toy, you know, to sort of have an EV, and they're, they're willing to manipulate their lives around the limitations of an EV. It's a second or third, it's or a fourth or third vehicle it, in their garage. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, and it's something they're willing to do, but they're not really making sacrifices, that first group, to make it happen. Um, our stewards, they care deeply about the environment. Uh, but there's, and, and by the way, the, that first group thinks EV is the solution to environmental problems. Our stewards, they're not so convinced EV is the right way to go. They, I mean, they have very positive views of EV. So um, when we talk to this new car buying population, for instance, 85% of everybody on the, in the survey had said basically, EVs are the future or an interesting idea. So from a very broad standpoint, there's a lot of positive uh, appeal to EVs. This group certainly fits in with that. You know, they, they see EVs as having a strong environmental benefit. The problem that exists with them is that they are as far as you could get from being a car enthusiast as any of these groups. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, you need to overcome very fundamental things with them like reliability and durability and how are you going to use it. Um, but it's also a group, interestingly, even though they care a lot about the environment, they're not a group that you'd really talk to about the environmental benefits either because they already know that. It's about overcoming some of these other issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, next group down from that. <laughs> so, yeah. Working so our, through it. Yeah, our, our next group down from that, uh, we call our survivors. And effectively, they're, they're very much a mainstream buyer. Um, we call them survivors. Now, again, these are, these are all new car buyers. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're our lowest income group, but they're not broke. Um, you know, they still have a household income of over. How big over. of a group uh, is this one? What so th percentage? This, this group is, uh, is over 25%. So this, this is the biggest group. Okay. Um, With a household income over? You were over $100,000. Yeah. Okay. So over $100,000. But, but it's more about how they view the world. You know, they really, they have this perspective that's one of a sort of getting through life and not taking on any additional complications. And so um, one of the, the things that this group does care about is they actually do care about the environment. However, an EV for them right now and probably you know, for the next number of years is a big leap to say, okay, do you care about the environment enough to take on this uncertainty that surrounds an EV? We think they're still a really interesting group because they're, they're such an important indicator of really the mainstream so, or the, you know, the early majority, if you will. Um, so an but important group. But you seem group. to be suggesting that maybe automakers should not market to them right now, maybe get EVs out there, get them more mainstream, then go after that group. Exactly, yeah. They're, they're a group to monitor long term, but when we look at the next vehicle that they're going to purchase, very few of this group are going to end up really seriously considering an EV for their next vehicle purchase. Yeah. Okay. I mean, these are people who, you know, potentially look at a lithium battery drill motor in the in the hardware store and don't buy it because they're not sure <laughs> that the battery is gonna is gonna it, it, precisely uh, work as long as they'd like. Yeah. Okay, we've gotten right. through four. Let's get through yeah. the next. Yeah. Two. All right. Yeah. yeah the, the next two. So our our next one after that we call the skeptic, and essentially this is a, a persona that is just doubting of everything. You know, it's very skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, there, when it comes to value, so a lot of what we did is we we really wanted to get past with this survey people being able to say, look, I'm a hand raiser, I'm interested in EV. Um, there are very few people. I mean, we look at traditionally over 70% of people um, know no more about an EV than the fact that it's electric and it's a vehicle. So a lot of what we spend our time doing was really trying to understand for people um, how they live their lives, what do they value, you know, what's important to them. And, and basically we can distill down and understand these different um, attributes for people and be able to say, look, you may not know a lot about EVs, but um, tell me certain things about your life and I can tell with a pretty high degree of accuracy how likely you are to consider an EV. The skeptics, when it comes to their life values, they're, they have no positive ones. Um, they're they never are, gonna buy an EV. They're just no. negative. Yeah, they're yeah. never gonna buy an EV. Yeah. Um, they just don't want really change at all. They think EVs are stupid. It, yeah. they, they do. <laughs> um, our last, you want me to describe our last Yeah, group? last one, yeah. Our last group we called Old Guard. And there are, are the people that really think EVs are stupid. <laughs> Not right? necessarily, no. though, right? Yeah, they. So they're they're as a group, they are our um, oldest, least ethnically diverse, uh, most rural, and the, by far the most likely to intend buying a pickup truck. The the, the thing is, though, is in some ways it, it would look easy to say, oh yeah, you know, kind of ignore them. We're you know, they'll be the the last ones. But the fact is, is that they're actually relatively successful people. 
Um, they, you know, they tend to be more kind of blue collar rather than white collar. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're pillars in their community. Um, they have, you know, they, they really value the way the world used to be. And so in a lot of ways, the current ethos of an EV, of being about the environment, sort of new, just doesn't appeal to them. That said, as a group, um, when we talk about, for instance, with power tools, they're a pretty pragmatic group. So right. if, if the benefits outweigh the cost, they will buy. But they're not going to buy for emotional reasons per se. In fact, you have to overcome those a little bit. So if it serves as an on-site generator or power source for their power tools at a job site, they may be interested in that instead of having to haul around a generator with them. Exactly. Uh, I mean, th their th gas-powered truck. Right. This is a group where you know when you had uh, Fiat 500Es for $49 a month, they would go and buy them because they'd say, "Well, look, you know, my suburban, I'm spending 60 bucks a week on fuel. I'm going to just buy one of those." <laughs> so you do have, yeah. you know, so, but but their the reasons for buying, obviously, as we look across these personas, are incredibly different. So the way you'd market to each of them varies. Very different, great. And, and I want to come back to the pickup buyers yeah, the because yeah. pickup. if you can go to them and go, "Hey, you, you know what? This electric one, a thousand horsepower, mm -hmm. eleven thousand foot pounds of torque. Mm -hmm. It can drive circles around your internal combustion engine V8 old style pickup." Then I think they're going to be a lot more right. You got to sell them on the attributes, so. on the capabilities. Right. right. I mean, when when I think it was brilliant when Ford came out and said, "Look, we're going to take this all electric F-150 and tow a million pounds." Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want a train, they towed a train. Yeah, exactly, right. yeah. towing a train. If you wanted to get attention of that group, that would you, you would do it. That said, as a group, they're going to be a hard group to convert. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can talk about you know, look from a towing capacity standpoint, it's great. That's not going to get them past other concerns that they have about range or where they're going to charge it or all kinds of other things. So I think it's a great way to start, but I think it's a long road to go with that group. You yeah, know, they're not going to buy a Cybertruck either. I, I want to ask right. you about where Ward's intelligence sees this mm -hmm. all going. I know, um, I know you got some numbers yeah, on yeah. your phone right, there, right, yeah. uh, because everybody, uh, you know, I think the general public perception is, oh my gosh, EVs, they're doing fantastic. The growth is great. But as yeah. we've pointed out, the numbers are so puny. Even with Tesla in there, 1.4 percent of all new cars. But I, right, I know it's right, going to right, grow right, in the yeah. future. What do you guys see? Well, I think we're looking out to you know the market by 2030 in the U.S. will only be 8 percent, according to the numbers that we have from our partner LMC Automotive. Uh, uh, globally, 15 and a half percent. I mean, that includes all of that China market. Um, uh, Bev sales are, were up in 2019, but are cratering to start off 2020, down by 50 percent. In the U.S. So, in the U.S. Yeah. So, uh, you know, looking out, yes, it's a growth area, but ICEs and other options are, are still leading the market for years to come. And Mike, this is a huge problem for the industry because by law, whether it's Europe, U.S., or China, they have to sell these EVs. Exactly. And yet, even with Ward's Intelligence looking mm -hmm. out at it, it, I mean, the growth on a percentage basis is great, but when you look at the total numbers, uh, maybe not so great. And, and there are some, some analysts that are much more optimistic. Ours is a pretty moderate view mm -hmm. yeah so but I, I think that that speaks to the challenge that we have here and I you know one of the things we're really talking to our clients about is getting out of this mindset of when you look at a vehicle that's going to be one percent of sales you treat it differently um, or you know even if it's just a vehicle or entire powertrain right it's about getting past that perspective you know one of the issues we had for instance is We've taken just as a given, if you're going to plan a sports car, you don't go and run out and talk to full-size SUV buyers. You know, we sort of appreciate that difference. Yeah. And yet, the way we've been doing it is we say, oh, it's an electric vehicle. Uh, let's go talk to people who bought an EV that looks nothing like what we're planning, and they bought it four years ago, and let's try to project that forward. And are we surprised you don't get results that you like or that you feel that you can really rely on? Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, we're trying to, and that's why with, with EV Ford, um, we really had it be as large as it is, because we needed the breadth and the depth to be able to say, look, the people who are buying EVs, or who are going to buy, um, by the way, they're already in the market now for the most part. They're, they are the people that have been buying gasoline vehicles. Why all of a sudden do we treat them different when they jump over? We need to be able to understand and say, look, um, 
What are those, if we're looking at a specific vehicle segment or a specific buyer, what are those trade-offs that they make? What are the preferences they have? And how do we help actually either market or shape product to be able to go after those? So I think it speaks to, look, it's a tough problem, but if it's a tough problem, you can't skirt around some of these issues. You really have to dive in in great detail. And if you do that, though, there's, there's hope of ways you can be more successful. Because I think that there's a lot of frustration right now with the amount of money that's getting spent on EVs with so little to show for it. And so I think there's hope given the vehicles that are coming and ways to be more strategic about it. Yeah, Bob, what are you guys looking at that you see the growth? Just the sheer numbers that uh, automakers are putting out there? I think, it, yeah, the volume of models. I mean, w what were the numbers that uh, we were talking about? Uh, right now, they're right, right now, Right now in the U.S. market, there's 16 battery electric vehicles, right. three of which are Teslas. Pure BEVs, And yeah. in about two years' time, if you believe what all the car companies say they're going to do, mm -hmm. there's going to be over 100 models of BEVs in showrooms. Mm -hmm. So to go from 16 to over 100 in just a few years time. And, you know, and Mike, as you've identified, there's some groups that could be interested, but a lot that have no interest in it at mm -hmm. all. This is a huge issue for the yeah, industry. And, and trying to get enough volume across 100 vehicles, 100 models is just uh, almost insurmountable. You have to have, it seems like, deep information like these buyer groups you've identified to figure out who to go after. And it can't be sort of the old way of, of sort of uh, creating the persona and then trying to build the vehicle and market and advertise to that, to that individual. It's a group. Exactly, yeah, so. it is a group. You know, it's, it's really not as simple as we've kind of imagined one potential buyer and we, we're gonna just go after them. I mean, even some of the vehicles we've talked about, they're gonna sell to different of these groups, and so in a lot of ways, but again, as we would expect with gasoline vehicles, there's not usually a buyer for a vehicle. We think of several. It's about understanding who they are and then having different messages, knowing that some of your messages aren't gonna resonate with some of your potential buyers, but other ones should resonate really strongly with them and can hopefully help you know, convert them. Mike, in, in the study that you did, mm -hmm. you talked to 10,000 different right. individuals, which is an amazing yeah. amount of money. That's yeah. so impressive. Yeah. But that was all in the U.S., right? That was all. What do you think you might find? Any guesses what you might find in Europe or, say, versus China? It's a really good question. We're, um, we've gotten a lot of interest to try to take this international. Um, and so we're looking at this year going to the, to the EU, um, going to China as well. Um, I think we're going to see some pretty big differences. Uh, you know, because in a lot of ways, when you dive into that detail, those assumptions get challenged. I mean, there's, there's many things that we, we hear routinely that's taken for granted in the industry that the, the research that we've done just challenges that and says, you know, that's really not the approach you take. I suspect we're going to see the same thing when we look at other markets. It's not necessarily, uh, we, we might have some overlap, but different characteristics of those markets are going to play out in very different ways. And I think messages that could work really well here aren't necessarily going to parlay over to other other markets. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's not just what you're finding is it's not just range or uh, those kinds of concerns. It's it, is it a vehicle that fits my lifestyle? Sure, it, it's all those things. I mean, in some cases, it's range. One of the the things that we actually found is that there's this this common theme of you know it's range and it's price. Well, with some of those buyers that I talked about, I mean, the first two, our torchbearer and our young enthusiast they're relatively price insensitive. If something really strikes them and works well, they can find a way to make it happen. And in terms of range, we actually found that charging time is a much more important lever for a lot of these people than, than range in isolation. And a lot of that is because when you look at the new car buying population, about 85% of that group owns their own home. And the vast majority of those people have the ability to charge at home. Not necessarily that it exists today, that they have, you know, most of them have, 110 outlet, something that could be upgraded to level two charging. But effectively, they want to do the vast majority of their charging at home, not planning that today I'm going to swing by Starbucks, be there for 50 minutes and hope that a charger is open. So when they do need to charge, there's much more of a sense of I need something fast to kind of get me the rest of the way. Um, so when you dive into that depth, you start finding some of these things we take for granted. They don't make sense, but you have really good justification why. And so that's why um, we have a, a number of partners on the energy side that are um, part of this work as well that, um, 
you know, we're, we're trying to reshape how infrastructure build-out is happening because it really needs to be more effective. Okay, we're getting down to the end here, but uh, everything that you've talked about is to retail customers. Mm -hmm. Fleets are going to buy a lot of these electric cars too. Is there anything Absolutely. with fleets that you would suggest to OEMs of how to market? So we, we actually have um, a partner study that's completely focused just on fleets. Um, and so it is, as one would expect, it's a very different set. And in a lot of ways, if we have six buyers for our, uh, our retail, you know, fleets more like a thousand. Um, so, because there's really just so much stratification in that market. So, there, to the extent there aren't any, you know, one or two, oh, do this and they will come. In fleet, it's even more difficult. You know, there's much more of needing to sort of delve into that detail and get into those specifics. But if you do it, there's, there's actually a lot of hope because, as you mentioned, there is some pretty good appeal to EVs great, to fleet. Great opportunity there to be able to have your chargers at one location, charge the vehicles, send them out. You can bring it back empty. That's fine. Precisely. Yeah. In, in that kind of an application, it's perfect. They come yeah. back to the yard every night and you can plug them in. That, right, right. So right. You, exactly. you get rid of that. So I would imagine, uh, you know, cost of ownership is what really matters to them. But I'm, I'm fascinated. You see much more stratification amongst fleets than you do amongst retail buyers. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah we, haven't, we haven't yet done a, a, a persona creation among the, uh, the fleet buyers. Um, it's something that you know, we're, we're exploring. Um, so you know, effectively on that one, we'll see. But at least the, the early evidence is, is that there's just so many different use cases. And because you know, fleet can span anything from people where I own one vehicle and I'm taking it, you know, that's, that's my work vehicle, to having 10,000. So there's just such variation yeah. in there. And with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you both for a very interesting for discussion. Mike DeVorney from Mescalin, Bob Gritzinger from Ward's Intelligence. Underwriting for the production of AutoLine this week has been provided by RSM. for challenges specific to your business by working with trusted advisors who help turn obstacles into opportunities. Experience the power of being understood. RSM, audit, tax and consulting for the middle market.